Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 123, Playing Together. Great cooperative kids games for family game night. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop for Cardboard Concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. All right, tonight we let our awesome Patreon patrons decide our topic, and they decided to answer a question from Skeeter, who's looking for cooperative kids games for a family game night. Sticking with that topic of cooperative games, we've got a review of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons from Ravensburger. After that, instead of having a second review like we usually do, we're going to have a longer than usual Bellhop's Tabletop segment, as Sean was down from Win- down in Windsor due to unfortunate circumstances. But we made the most of it by getting to hang out for the first time in over a year, and part of that was, of course, getting some games in. So you're going to get to hear both our opinions on a number of games. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk both positive and negative. First up, a comment on our rogue book review from Matron Voss. Is it a roguelike or a card game? Being both doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, Martin, it definitely is both as far as I'm concerned. It has the roguelike aspects of exploration and discovery and starting fresh at the bottom of the dungeon every game and trying to work your way up to the top floor and happens to use deck building for combat. So I did mention this to Martin in a reply on MeWe, and he noted he doesn't feel it's a real roguelike unless you literally wipe the slate every time. You start from scratch every time where previous games don't have any impact on future runs. Now, that is the way the original Rogue worked, where the name Rogue work com- roguelike comes from. Games like NetHack and other games like that. Personally, I, I guess I get it that like if that's what you're looking for, but I'm glad we evolved like to have some kind of progression from game to game. Like I did, I played Rogue back in the day on our Amiga um, and I loved it, but I do like the feel of getting a little bit more, a little further ahead and getting some advantage and actually building up a bit, no matter how small that is each run. So while I do understand his stance, it seems a bit limiting. If someone has a new innovation on a game type, do we really need to develop a new description and we can't, you know, carry on? Uh, Yeah, I I actually play a, a Windows version of... Uh, rogue called pathos um regularly still um and it is a you know real roguelike except it actually has uh some some graphics it's not pure uh pure ascii <laughs> yeah but um yeah no I, I again it's 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 a combination of the two uh which is a new thing and a deck builder with no progression just doesn't really make any sense well no that's not at all now, up next, a comment from True Flight Silverwing on our comparison of Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion to the base game. What I would like to know is if some of these changes and upgrades to the system will be included in future printings of Gloomhaven and Frosthaven. I would love to see them add a sheet of initiative tokens to Gloomhaven, along with putting the dotted lines on the ability cards. I doubt it will ever happen, but there is hope. <laughs> Rumor is that they are looking into making the map books for the other games to replace the tiles. That would be an awesome and welcome change, though I worry about how big the Gloomhaven book would have to be. Well, thanks for the comment, Drew, True Flight. Um, the, the timing on this question is fantastic because you'll be happy to know that some of the things in Jaws of the Lion are not only getting added to Frosthaven, but being improved upon. Uh, just the other day, I was looking at the new card design and I actually threw it in our uh, tabletop bellhop chat so Sean could see it as well, because actually one of his main complaints about Gloomhaven was trying to understand the cards and the grammar they chose to use. And they have actually done a ton of work to make the ability cards even easier to understand than in Jaws of Lion. Like not only did they put the jotted lines between separate abilities, but they actually did this thing where they use like a shaded box for things that only happen if the main action is used. So you can easily tell what's based on an action and what happens just for putting the card on the table. Now, what I haven't seen is anything about initiative tokens so far for Frosthaven. So uh, I'm not sure if that's coming. And Frosthaven is definitely sticking with tiles for the maps instead of a book. And I think at this point, it's too late to change. Like, besides the fact they've already got it produced or whatever, I think there'd be people upset because there are people who like the tiles. They like to steal them and use them for D&D and people that like that aspect of the game. And you already have, like, the backers have already backed, right? They've, you already have their money. I would think changing at this point is probably a bit of a problem. 
Now, as for updating a new printing of Gloomhaven, there's no plan for that at this time. Um, from what I understand, they have produced enough copies of the fourth printing that they don't expect to run out, especially now that Frosthaven's going to be out. And now, I could be completely wrong, and maybe it'll suddenly sell out and they'll do another one, but I don't think they're going to change anything in Gloomhaven at this point, especially not graphic design and card design level. Like, at this point, the game's out. Now, what I would love to see, though, is for Isaac to put out a lower price point of Gloomhaven and replace all those tiles with a book because then you could shrink the box and you could reduce the weight of the box. And I have to assume that a booklet full of maps is cheaper to produce than a bunch of two-sided tiles. I actually think that would sell well. Like get a, get a $75 or $60 point price point, big box Gloomhaven, but not as small as Jaws of the Lion and not as big as the original. Although you would lose the full uh, random dungeon delving with the with the book wouldn't you that's true yeah yeah you would you would though i i honestly i don't not know if it's completely it. true <laughs> we seem to be the only people who have ever talked about it no one seems to play random dungeons in gloomhaven right I, I i'm assuming they're out there but i have never heard anyone but us talk about random dungeons in gloomhaven there we go all right well for the rest of this segment we've got a ton of feedback on our topic of engine building games and what we thought were the best engine builders this topic has proved to be extremely popular on social media. First up, Keith J. Davies commented, I have played three of those games, Race for the Galaxy, which I did not enjoy, Terraforming Mars, and Splendor, both of which I do like. Once I would like to add to the list, the Century Games, the first two but not combined, Valeria Card Kingdoms, Terra Mystica, Engine Building Brain Burner. <laughs> now, Toosie commented, I just got Splendor and love it. While Dylan Zimmerman is also a fan saying, I love Splendor. I'm also really a fond of Century Spice Road. James Gray had this to say, I think I played four, if you count the honorable mentions. I think I like Wingspan for having a lot of good synergy options. It can be greatly about luck with Terraforming Mars, but it's still a good game overall. Wingspan is not, is not really simplistic like Splendor is. And Francois Uldry added, Splendor is a classic here. Mars I am not a fan of. Roll for the Galaxy we all enjoy. I have Le Havre we never played. <laughs> now for this batch, we're going to end with Matt, who wrote, I love engine builders, having Splendor and Wingspan. I will play Wingspan 99 out of 100 over Splendor. Not that I don't enjoy Splendor. I just enjoy Wingspan that much more. <laughs> Everdell is easily my favorite game right now. You must both play. You must play both. I would love to, like to add Imperial Settlers to this list. Mm -hmm. Also, a few others I don't hear mentioned on engine builder lists are Century Spice Roads and Dominion, probably because it's a deck builder, but I find the most success when I make my deck into an engine. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the great article. All right, first off, I got to say I love seeing all this interaction. I, I wish we got this much feedback on every topic we cover. It was great to see. Second, I got to say, wow, is that a lot of love for Splendor in Century Spice Road? Uh, personally, I played Century Spice Road. Um, it was a friend's copy. It was at the local game store. We were at Brimstone Games. And it just, it felt very similar to Splendor. Like, I just felt like I was doing the same kinds of things. And it just wasn't different enough to justify me purchasing a new game. Now, I'll admit, I could see Jones Theory Splendor, right? Replace Splendor, get rid of it, and get Spice Road instead. But Deanna actually really likes Splendor and asked me to keep it. My daughter likes Splendor as well. Now, reading all these comments, I do think maybe I should sit down and give Spencery Spice Road a try again. Uh, what I'd like to try is the Golem edition, which is a, a newer printing of the game. That it, It's the exact same game, but theme about trying to get power cells for a Golem is just cooler than trading spices down the Spice Road to me. So maybe that would help as well. I am glad to see most people are agreeing with the list, uh, though there are some exceptions. Like, I don't know, people who don't like Race for the Galaxy and Terraforming Mars? Come on! Though, so, you know what? Totally fair. Not every game is for everyone, and we understand that here. Uh, there are also a number of recommendations here that we missed, uh, stuff that was not on our list or in the honorable mentions. Stuff like Imperial Settlers, Dominion, Le Havre, Wingspan, Valeria Card Kingdoms, and Terra Mystica. What we will do is what we do with all of these recommendations is we will throw them in the show notes below, and you can check out those games for yourself. Well, finally... Let's leave off with a couple of more comments on engine building from people who seem to get the wrong, the idea wrong. Now, Naomi Aris commented, does Forbidden Desert count? I love that game. 
And Alan Kellogg says, for me, the best engine builder was Mousetrap. All right. So those comments right there are two things. One, an example of why I thought it was be worth having a show discussing about what we meant on engine builders. And two examples of people who don't click the link before commenting and obviously didn't read the article because uh, they're talking about something completely different. Uh, this is a game style I don't think we mentioned. Like when we even had a whole episode, we were talking about different styles of board games. I think we kind of missed this one. And I'm not sure what to call it because what you do in both these games is you build something physically, like you you actually assemble something. Uh, you 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 spend the game collecting components, and you can't win the game until you have all the components and you put them together. Now, I could see how you can think of that as building an engine or something, but that's not what we mean when we say engine building board games. Now, these games, I'm thinking I'd, I'd call them building games or assembly games, or I, I don't know, any game where you're actually putting pieces together while playing. Uh, a great modern example of that would be Control, CTRL, from Pandasaurus, where you have this brick and you're putting blocks on it and it grows out. Or the abstract game Santorini, where you're actually like building up towers, making the city of Santorini. I, I don't know. What do you think about that as a game type? Yeah, it's it's weird. And there's a few of those. There's a few um, office uh, desk, you know, uh, executive yeah. office type games that, that are on the same sort of thing. To me, Mousetrap is really almost more of a dexterity game. <laughs> but what it actually is, is just a roll and move. Um, well, yeah. there's no, I mean, you move and, and whoever gets to a space first puts the piece out. Uh, the reason I call it a dexterity game is because at least the old, like 1970s or early eighties version I had was so finicky that if you put a piece in wrong, you would trigger the entire oh, yeah. contraption and have to spend, you know, 15 minutes resetting the whole thing before the game could continue on. Yeah, I definitely remember that aspect. But then that's similar to the like climbers where we're like, this isn't actually a dexterity game, but there is an element of dexterity to it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, climbers is a building game. I mean, you are building yeah, you are building. the very structure you are playing on at the same time. So it's an interesting uh, uh, theme or concept or type of game that yeah. we haven't really discussed yet. No, it's true. But definitely not engine builders when we're talking about no. engine building board games. That's something different where you're using the mechanics of the game to put things together to try to get build score or points or whatever you need to win the game. Well, if you want to know what we mean when we say engine building board games, be sure to check out episode 120 of our podcast. That's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Well, thanks to everyone who stops in and catches us live in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. Yeah, so a couple of things going on in the chat room that I think are worth mentioning tonight. For one, uh, people are discussing single cup coffee makers, not Keurigs, but they do both. But uh, one of the important ones, I think, for fans of the show is, is May Suggins has decided that the Bellhop fans are going to be called the lobbyists, which I think makes perfect sense because they are, we always, they, we call our chat room here on Twitch the lobby and we introduce the lobby. We're checking in with the lobby right now. So having the lobbyists in the lobby, I think makes perfect sense for us. And then we do have also some love of Everdell going on. We got all kinds of hearts and people talking about how much they love Everdell. So I don't know how much engine buildings in Everdell. I haven't played it. That's the game with the big tree that goes in the middle of the table. Everyone keeps telling me I got to play it. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, it's one of those games I just kind of missed out on. And I don't have easy access to to get a try. And it does seem like a try before you buy for me. Almost everything's a try before you <laughs> buy anymore for me. Fair enough. All right. So tonight we are talking about cooperative games you can play with the whole family, including kids. As usual, we'll be looking to the chat room for any games we may miss. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we're featuring a question picked by our awesome Tabletop Bellhop patron, Patreon patrons. Become a Patreon patron at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, and you too could help influence future topics, as well as get other cool stuff like bonus audio, show notes, behind-the-scene blog posts, and access to the to our Discord. Now, our question tonight comes from Skeeter, who asked, any recommendations for cooperative games for uh, kids for family game nights? 
All right. Thanks so much for the question, Skeeter, and for our patrons, all of them, and the ones that helped us decide on this question tonight. Now, this is slightly ironic because we have someone who showed up in the lobby tonight that we haven't seen in quite some time, because this question is very similar to one of the questions we first answered on the show back in July 2018. Uh, that was episode two or three. Back then, patron of the show Brian Kurtz was looking for less known kids cooperative kids games he was looking for uh hidden gems games that, that everyone hadn't heard of before and at this point this topic's almost three years old and a number of things have happened in that time for one my kids have gotten older so i'm playing different games with them second a whole bunch of new games have been released since then right we talked about it like six thousand to ten thousand games a year so i think what's going to happen is we're going to have some overlap. We're going to have other things. Plus, Skeeter's actually looking for something different. Brian was looking for un, like lesser-known cooperative kids games, whereas Skeeter's specifically looking for family night games. So to me, that implies the parents will be playing too. And I'm going to be specifically looking for games that are not only fun for kids, but engaging enough to keep adults entertained as well. While Hasbro and many of the mass market companies have often tried to claim game night as their own, there are many good options out there in the hobby gaming market to better suit a family game night. So realize, first of all, there will be some overlap with the old list, though I think there's going to be plenty of new stuff here. Now, one thing I want to do before we get into the list, I'm going a bit off script here, is I did want to talk about why I think cooperative games are great for playing with kids for a couple reasons one of the main ones are some kids do not deal well with competition and by playing a cooperative game you're all in it together and you're working together and you either all lose or you all win so there's no conflict well there shouldn't be any conflict between the individual players second the second biggest thing to me that why i love cooperative games with kids is that coaching is allowed it's part of the game it's something that's encouraged uh, many of these games you're going to play with open hands or all the information on the table and the parents can coach the kids without ruining the experience right like you don't want to coach your opponent or you don't want to be in teams and you're you're helping the kids win and cheating basically right with a cooperative game at least most of the ones we're going to mention tonight there's no reason not to play with open cards or everything on the table so that the parents can work with the kids to beat the game together and i don't know if you have other reasons you think would be these would be good but those were the two main things that hit me as why you should play cooperative games with your kids yeah no, or other I, people's kids i think just just doubling down on that cooperative versus competitive uh kids are going to be introduced to so much competition in their lives mm. through school and through sports and through other activities uh, why why do you need to reinforce that at home when you could be just working together as a family and building those family bonds up? Very fair. So one of the things I didn't want to do tonight is break these games into specific age categories. And the reason for that is every kid is different. And you know the kids you're gaming with better than I do. Now, what I did do is I listed these in what I think of as the complexity and difficulty level so the ones earlier on the list are generally going to be better for younger kids and the ones later on the list are going to be better for older kids now that's not going to be a hard and fast rule uh if you happen to be the kid who or the parent with the six-year-old that can play power grid all the power to you um but this i think is going to apply to most things mo most most average game groups nobody but you knows your kids and those ages on the box are most often due to regulations mm -hmm. not reality yeah, that's to be true. I did not actually look up what the age recommendations were on these games. This is all based on my personal experience with our kids. And, and, and a couple of these actually based on some of my friends' experience with the kids. So I, to be honest, I don't know what age ages would be on these boxes. So we're, we're just going to wing it for that. <laughs> all right. The first game on the list tonight is Outfoxed. This is a cooperative deduction game for younger kids. Uh, in it, you are all playing fox detectives who are trying to figure out which one of the animals in the town stole a pie. Um, it uses a really cool plastic decoder to randomize who done it and to give you clues. So when you talk to an animal, you get to draw a card and put it on. And it'll give you an idea like, oh, the culprit wore a hat or the culprit didn't have glasses. And you use that while looking at all the various animals in the city and the cards that show them to try to deduce who it is. And then you get to the end and you flip it over and see if you were right. 
I got to admit, this one's not great for parents, right? I said I wanted to give a list that keeps the game engaging. I'll admit the first couple games are, are pretty good. Like you get into it, but then you start to see the patterns and like there's only so many options. And I got to admit, it's not overly engaging, but you know what? There aren't a lot of toddler games that are engaging for parents. This one does a pretty decent job. This will be fun the first couple times, and then hopefully the kids kind of take it on their own or grow into bigger games. And that was Outfoxed. Up next, I have Robot Turtles. Uh, this STEM game was actually one of the very first big Kickstarter successes, big board game Kickstarter successes. This is a programmed movement game that will remind old timers like myself and Sean of Logo or Turtle Graphics. You set up some gems on a grid on a board, and then the players are challenged to program their robot turtles to collect them all. Now, I'll admit, when I got this, I was impressed by the quality, but I was disappointed by the number of scenarios that were given in the box. But you know what? That went away quickly because my kids loved making challenges for each other and for us. Because there's things like you put walls out and the turtles can push each other and stuff like that. And, and they would make themselves puzzles and then they would make puzzles for us. And then we design challenges for them. Plus, if you're into robot turtles, there's forums online. And I don't know if there's like an official robot turtle website, but you can find all kinds of scenarios online, including additional rules with like new things to put out on the map people have come up with. This game has a following and there's quite a bit of support out there for it. All right, what? That was Robot Turtles. I got to ask before I go on, you know exactly what I meant by logo and turtle graphics, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? And, yeah, uh, I'm like, you're room, the right age group. Yep, in our chat room as well. Uh, that was, yeah. you know, from, from the, the pet and the Commodore 64 computers. Yeah. yeah, that's where you had to program your robot. Like forward three, turn right, forward two. Pen the on, Robot Turtles is actually... Pen down. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Pen up, pen down. Robot Turtles was actually more impressive than that because it actually had, um, you could do procedural calls, function calls. Oh, so nice. you could have a function that was off to the side. So you could say like do loop and it would go do the loop. It, it was actually really well done. Nice. Again, that was Robot Turtles. I jumped back a bit. <laughs> up next, uh, something that I think if you have kids, you should pick up. And that is a set of Rory Story Cubes. These come in every possible conceivable set you can think of from actions to buildings to batman to spongebob to doctor who you can get a story cube set for almost anything if you have picked up one you're probably gonna want more i find that's a, that's a thing with horror story cubes um i started off with the basic set and then i got the action set then i got the places set and then i went on to i have uh a, there's a star wars set we don't actually have that one yet so what story cubes are is a set of d6 six-sided dice with images on the side and all you use them for is for inspiration to do improv based story gaming um the other people who might actually want a set of these is anyone getting into rpgs like these are great for i don't know what's in the town roll some story cubes now each set of story cubes is going to come with a wide number of games that can be played with them and i'm kind of stretching our definition of co-op game here a lot of them are cooperative but there are some competitive ones where everyone gets their own dice and they try to use their dice up first but there are a lot of cooperative games well, the boxes include a number of games, this is another one where if you go online and like Google games to play with Rory Story Cubes, you're going to get a ton of hits. People have done some really cool stuff with Story Cubes. And that was Rory's Story Cubes. Up next, I have Forbidden Island. Uh, to this day, I credit Forbidden Island as being one of the biggest inspirations for one of our girls learning to read. Now, that makes it sound like it's going to be a reading heavy game, and it's not. This is literally all it has are location cards that say what the location is called, like Red Lighthouse or something like that. But my daughter, while playing this game, really wanted to be able to find the card so that I would draw the card and I would say Red Lighthouse, and she'd be able to find the word Red Lighthouse. And then later to do the opposite, where she could draw the card and tell us which one to find. So again, it's not a word game, but man, this game was great for that. Like just being able to play games was great to get her into reading more. Now, this is a great cooperative game, good for pretty much every age, because you can play this with open hands. Uh, as I was talking about earlier, things that are good about cooperative games, and you can easily coach the kids. Or once you've gotten better at the game, you can play with closed hands. Now, the goal is you're on an island, you need to recover four artifacts and get off the island before it sinks and every round it starts sinking more and more. Another nice touch in this game is that it features variable difficulty levels that you can scale up as the kids and honestly the parents gain in experience. 
Now, once you've kind of mastered Forbidden Island, if you want a more involved game, um, which is better for older kids, also check out Forbidden Desert. That's the next one in the line. And that was Forbidden Island and, and or Forbidden Desert. Next up, the disappointingly named The Game, uh, probably the worst name in all board game history. The Game is a really so solid cooperative card game with a really basic premise. You are trying to make two stacks of cards, one going up from numbers one to 100 and another going down from numbers one to 100. This is a great one for helping kids that struggle with counting and number recognition. And the neat part in this game is there's a little mechanic to give you an advantage where you can play a card that's exactly 10 away from one of the current face up cards to jump back, right? So to kind of dial back on a deck and give you a chance to play more cards. This is a could again be a perfect information game, but you don't want to show your hands. This is not one where you wanted to open the table that would make the game too easy. But you play your five, you play your six, you play your seven, but you are allowed to talk. Like, oh, I think I can put, you can't talk about the exact numbers you have. You're like, jump a little further, or don't go too far ahead, or just squeeze in a little more, or don't play too quick. You know, you can kind of throw that in there. And it's a really neat cooperative game with a really silly name. And that was the game. Similar to the game with a better name is The Mind. This is actually a follow-up to the game. And to be honest, I know it's the same publisher. I'm not sure if it's the same designer, but I think it might be. Um, this is one I like better. I prefer The Mind to the game. In this unique game, you're also trying to play your hand of cards and you're going from one to 99. So it's just one stack going one to 99. But in The Mind, you're not allowed to talk. Not only that, you're not allowed to communicate at all. If you play by the pure rules, there's allowed no communication. The first hand of the game, you have one card. If you have four players, someone's got to put the lowest, the second lowest, third lowest, and the last card down in numeric order. If you do that, you win. Then you go to round two, where everyone has two cards. Then you go to round three, where everyone has three cards. And then just keep stacking up. This one has proven to be I, I, almost ridiculously popular. The mind kind of exploded both with kids and with adults. This is a great party game, a great game to break out at a cafe or at a bar, and just as fun to play with your kids. Uh, and those are different uh, designers. So Okay, I thought it might be. I know it was the same publisher. Uh, and that was The Mind, also re-implemented by The Mind Extreme, where you're going up and down at the same uh, uh yeah, so, that one adds the two piles, which is yeah. part of why I thought it might be the same as the game. I have not tried that one, so I can't recommend that. Sounds like it might be better for older kids. Next, I have Castle Panic. Uh, I think everyone knows the term tower defense, and that's what this is based on, is the video game mechanic of tower defense, where you have a city or something you're trying to defend, and waves and waves of enemies are coming in. This has a fantasy theme, generic fantasy, where you are in a castle at the center of the board, and you have waves of monsters coming in. The monsters are drawn at random from a bag, so you never know if you're just going to have a couple weak goblins coming in, or be surrounded by a horde of ogres. Now, I'll admit it, I am not a huge fan of this game. But many of my friends with kids swear by it. I'll, when I played this, I didn't have kids. Or if I had kids, I didn't play it with them. I can't remember which. It's an older game. I don't know if it's quite as old as my kids or not. Um, but it, I, I don't know. I found it a little too simple. Uh, but if kids love it, why not, right? It's, it's definitely more engaging than some kids' games that are out there. Now, once your kids do get older, what I would try, and this one I do own, is Star Trek Panic. This is a much more involved version of the same game that's significantly more detailed, but features this awesome looking cardboard star or enterprise and plastic shields that go around it and damage counters that go on it, which is also being changed to be mission paced. So you are trying to complete missions as well as defending from whatever's out in space around you. Now, the other thing I noticed actually while doing research for this show is there is now a My First Castle Panic which seems like a great way to experience this Tower of Defense game with even younger kids. Now, again, I didn't even have kids when I played the first one. My first Castle Panic didn't exist when my kids were kids, so I can't recommend it from personal experience, but I know the game is popular with parents. And that was Castle Panic, which came out uh, around the time of your second. So Okay, so I, I, it might have been possible I could have picked it up, but I definitely, I played it at Origins. I remember that, and that's about it. Up next, I have Codenames Duet. 
Now, Codenames Duet is the cooperative version of Codenames. And as I like to point out every time we bring up this game, despite what the name says, the name Duet, and what that implies, and what most people online seem to think, this is not two-player Codenames. It's cooperative code names, where the players split into two teams, which we found was perfect for family game nights, with either each parent pairing up with one kid, so they kind of have like a balance of experiences, or playing the kids versus us versus them, right? The kids versus us. Now, in code names, each player, each team gives a one word clue to the other team, trying to get them to guess face up words pertaining to that clue. If you manage to find all the words for each side before running out of clue tokens, you win as a team. But if you hit an assassin, you lose. And there's two assassins when playing duet, and each team can only see one of them. Really great version of codename. I actually prefer duet to playing regular codenames. Even if I have six adults, I would rather play a three-on-three -three game of duet than play codenames. And uh, Codenames Duet has uh, appeared online now. They have the official, yes. they've got an official online version as well. And that was Codenames Duet. Next up, we have the newest game on this list, and that is the Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins board game. Uh, this was introduced by Hasbro in 2020, just last year, as a new introduction to the world of Dungeons & Dragons. While mechanically rather boring, this game shines by promoting players to tell stories as they play including descriptions of how they react to the situations presented in the game and how they manage to pull off their characters' signature attacks. This is a great way to introduce your kids to structured storytelling and the world and like the monsters and the names and the, the, the whole experience that is Dungeons & Dragons. And that is Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins. Next, I have Flashpoint Fire Rescue. This is one, anytime we talk about co-op games, I'm going to bring up. This is a game where the players are playing firefighters trying to save people and pets from a burning building. Now, when playing with younger kids, you can play this at a fairly low age due to the open information and coaching. And it has a nice set of family rules that are rather simple, where you just randomly determine where the fires show up and you just have four basic actions. Add in the advanced rules as your kids get older and more experienced. Now, the full rules are more than enough for hobby gamers. Like, it's a solid, decent, cooperative game just for hobby gamers. And if that's not enough, you can get additional maps and expansions that add even more options and more complexity, including all kinds of like special equipment you can wear and like having the fire truck there and putting out a fire on a plane that's currently flying through the air. This is a great cooperative game overall, and for many years was actually my go-to cooperative game of choice. If someone said they wanted to play a cooperative game, this is what I would bring out. Yeah, the Flashpoint Fire Rescue is one that we comes up anytime we're talking about kids' games of any sort, really, yeah. uh, especially competitive. That is Flashpoint Co Fire Rescue. Cooperative. cooperative Say competitive. Sorry. Especially cooperative. It's cooperative. All right, here, here is the game that does come up anytime we mention kids' games. Uh, anytime anyone talks about kids' games, the first place I send them is to Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. What I want to add to this, though, is the Creepy Cellar expansion, because this was our number one recommendation the last time we had this topic three years ago. Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters is still by far the best kids' game we played. It's great fun for kids, more than engaging enough for adults. I, I have broke this out with every age group out there. This is a game my kids will break out on their own, but also a game will break out when the kids aren't here or once they've gone to bed. Or often we play it once they go to bed, we keep playing. What's new, though, this time is the Creepy Cellar expansion, which we just reviewed last week. So I'm not going to get into full details of it, but this expansion is a great addition to ghost fight and treasure hunters It not only adds some new content but it actually rebalances the game uh giving players more options on their turn and a little more control and just improving it overall making it a more complete game and that is ghost fight and treasure hunters with creepy seller expansion next on the list is probably going to be sean's favorite as far as i'm concerned and that is harry potter hogwarts battle uh which at the time was an honorable mention on our last list because i hadn't played it yet but since then we have gotten my kids into it this is this is game's perfect um one of the things we talked about when engaging kids in a game is to uh play a game that in, that about a license they like, right? Something they're already excited about. So this is a great game to introduce to kids if you have any Potterheads in your family. This is a gateway deck building game 
that progresses from like super gateway deck builder, like almost as basic as you can get in book one to a rather complicated deck building game by book seven, and then gets even more involved and complicated with the expansions. Now, what I like about this is that if you're playing with kids and you hit a book where they're not comfortable anymore, that it just got to be too much, you can just stop and keep playing by the earlier book's rules until they're comfortable enough to move on. Now, while adults may want to start with book three or four to dive into it for the full complexity, I once we have your family, just start at book one, work your way through, stop where the kids are comfortable, and move on when they're ready. Yeah, the nice thing about uh, the family play is they really are books one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So you can enjoy the story uh, playing out to some degree, mm -hmm. as well as the building complexity. Uh, or again, you know, if you are an experienced deck builder player and you, you're a bunch of adults one time, break out book four, you know, one through four all together at once, and you can get right into it with all the features available. Mm -hmm. And that was Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle. Next up, I have Stuffed Fables. So again, going back to our list three years ago, I talked a lot about Mice and Mystics. Now I'll say Mice and Mystics is still a good game, but I no longer recommend that as a great game to pick up to play with your kids. Because since that time, the same designer and publisher has put out a better storybook game. And one that just is a better mechanically and better suited to kids, and that's Stuffed Fables. In this game, you play stuffies. These are stuffed animals. And the story starts with your girl, your human, spending her first night in a big girl bed and you defending her from the monsters under the bed and getting sucked into their world. Stuff Fables just features simpler mechanics. It's the, the, I would call Mice and Mystics a dungeon crawler. This is more of a story game with different things going on that just use different colors of D6s. Um, and like health is trapped by your stuffing falling out. It's just easier to more approachable both mechanically and a more kid-friendly storyline because mice and mystics is actually pretty dark with assassinations and getting turned into a, a mouse where you may not want to so stuff fables is now replaced mice and mystics for my go-to storybook game for kids and that was stuffed fables uh, next up, now we're definitely getting into more hobby games, stuff that adults are going to enjoy even more and stuff for, better for older kids. And I'm going to start that off with Horrified Universal Monsters. Now, earlier I talked about the fact that Flashpoint used to be my go-to co-op game. Whenever I got together with people like, oh, I like cooperative games, that's what I break out. Well, that has shifted to this game. Now, you may think that horror movie game wouldn't be great for kids, but you know what? Horrified Universal Monsters is based on the, the older, campy, black and white Universal Monster movies. There also aren't any horror elements in the game. There's no blood. There's no, like, yes, you collect a gun. Yes, you collect a baseball bat, but you turn it in. Like, there's no real attacking in it. Uh, it it's, it's about as light as you can get for a horror game. One of the great things about Horrified, besides the fact it's just a fantastic game, read my full review if you want to see just why we love Horrified, is that you can adjust the difficulty based on the player's skill level. So if I was playing with kids, what I'd do is start with one monster. And if they crush the one monster, now try two monsters. And then if they crush that, move on to three monsters and so on. And if you can get your kids to beat five monsters, you've done better than I have with a group of adults. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Horrified is just a fantastic game. And, and that, that variable difficulty is just so flexible for uh, any, any age group. And that is Horrified Universal Monsters. Next up, I have The Crew Quest for Planet Nine. This is a cooperative trick-taking game for up to five players. Players are going to work together to complete missions. These missions are going to require that each player win tricks containing specific cards sometimes in a specific order. Now the core game here comes with 50 missions of increasing difficulty. And just like Hogwarts Battle, what I like about here is you would start at mission one, which is really simple. It's like one person has to take one card and that's it. And you have the whole deck in front of you, but you can keep playing. And then once it starts getting too hard for your kids, you can always go back and replay the easier missions. If there's a specific mission type, you found a lot of fun, play it over and over again. The problem here is we're getting into higher complexity level. This is a game where you are not allowed to share information. So it's the exact opposite. This is not a game where you'll be able to coach the kids. So this is only going to work if your kids already understand 
basic trick taking. Like you're going to want to sit down and teach them to play Euchre, Spades or Hearts first, probably before diving into the crew. But this is a really cool one to get the family together around the table, just playing a simple card game that doesn't take a lot of room. But it is definitely a, a tougher one as as groups of adults we have struggled. Yes. Uh, even within the first 20 missions at times. So that was the crew the quest for Planet Nine. All right, the last one on my list tonight is Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. My girls love the theme on this cooperative board game where the players take on the role of one of the DC Comics Amazons and work together to defend the island of Themyscira from enemies, including Ares, Circe, and the Cheetah. Uh, what I like about this game is it eliminates quarterbacking through program, uh, like a unique program movement system with some hidden information. Like the players have to program three moves a turn, but only get two charts to choose from when they can plan and talk. But then when you're actually programming your moves, you have more cards, but you're not allowed to talk anymore. I love this because you don't have, it, it removes the coaching completely, which at this point, this is one that's definitely for kids with some significant board game experience. This isn't a gateway game. This is definitely not the first co-op game I throw at my kids, but if they have already enjoyed and you played every other game on the list till now, this might be a great next step without that quarterback and without that coaching, because you can't. This is good for kids who want to express their independence. They don't want you to help them anymore. They want to do their own thing. Well, they get to do that in this game. So that was Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Now, for those of you here live and listening to the podcast, you can learn more about Wonder Woman in our review segment later in the show. So we do have some honorable mentions I want to bring up at the end of the show here. Um, these are games that we haven't personally played ourselves, but ones that have been recommended to us by friends or family or games that I've seen on other top lists that look like they, they're on multiple top kids games lists or games that I wish I owned that look like they'd be awesome for playing with kids. So the first one is mm, as in MMM exclamation mark. Like, mm, that's good. Uh, this was a 2016 Kinderspiel de Jar winner that right there, it's probably good. Like anything that wins the Kinderspiel is probably worth picking up as long as it's in the right age group. That's the problem is some of the Kinderspiel games, they're definitely on a scale. Sometimes they're definitely for younger kids and sometimes they're for older kids. This is definitely on the younger kid scale. This looks like it's one for, for younger generation um i obviously didn't get to try this because in 2016 my kids were way too old for this one so we never got to try it ourselves now this is a push your luck dice game where you're trying to roll food on your dice and sneak into the kitchen and grab a, a, all the food you can before getting caught by the family cat so if you roll too many cats are out sounds really neat sounds really simple looks like a solid game and that was mm. Next up, I have Mole Rats in Space. This is a cooperative card game about mole rats trying to escape their doomed spaceship. Uh, this one came up as a recommendation for fans three years ago when we covered cooperative kids games, and I still think it belongs on the list. Now, again, by the time I learned about this game, it was a little too simple looking for my girls, so we haven't played it ourselves. But the recommendation still stands. And that was Mole Rats in Space. Up next, I have Hoot Owl Hoot. Uh, this one came from Brian, the fan who sent in the original question and is another game that my girls were just a little too old for at the time. Now, this one reminds me a bit of a cooperative version of Candyland because players are playing colored cards to move owls with the end goal of getting them all home to their nest. And that was Hoot Owl Hoot. On the couple games that I would love to get for my kids now that I think we'd have a great time with, and the first is Slide Quest. Uh, this is a newer cooperative game, just came out in 2019. It's a dexterity game that's based on the old wooden desktop game Labyrinth, where you're turning the dials to try to get a marble to go through a maze. Well, in Slide Quest, that marble is replaced by a knight with a little ball bearing in its base, and it's you're trying to navigate it around a maze-like board and get it to fall into the right hole. The interesting bit here is that every player is holding one an individual paddle thing like and you play like in the box this looks like a ton of fun i i would love to try this one with the kids plus i think it'd be a good um i i will adult beverage game as well and that was slide quest 
All right, the last game I have for tonight, this is another storybook game uh, from the same publisher as Mice and Mystics and Stuff Fables, though a different designer. It's not, uh, it's not Jeremy, Jeremy Hawthorne. Uh, this is Quirky Circuits. This is a cooperative program movement game, but not like, say, Robo Rally or Robot Turtles, because you are all programming the same cute-looking robot. Uh, one of the robots is actually a cat riding around on a Zumba. I thought it was a Roomba, sorry, whatever they're called. Roomba, Zumba is like the exercise thing my kids do. <laughs> on a Roomba, and there's all these cute things. You open up the storybook, and you are putting out cards. And the thing is, you don't know what the other people are programming. And that just sounds really fascinating, because I love program movement games like i'm a huge robot rally fan i'm a huge robot turtles fan i love um mice and not mice and mystics uh, uh what's the league of legend one i can't remember the league of legends game what it's called if it comes back to me i will mention it totally skipping my mind whatever i like program movement games and a cooperative program movement game is something i've never like okay sorry wonder woman's a cooperative program movement game but you're all programming your own it's it's the you are programming mechs versus minions there that's the League of Legends game. I got it before the chat. I feel good. Uh, but you're programming the same robot, and that sounds amazing. I, I I really want to try this one. Like this is a if we were going to game stores locally, I'd be like, please let me run a demo night of this game so I can try this game out. Because I think it's one that if you just saw it on the table, people are going to want this game. And that was Quirky Circuits. Well, that's it for our list of cooperative kids games for family game night. Let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add all right you find folk in the chat room i've been seeing it scroll by i've been trying to ignore and not reply to uh some of the answers in there what are some cooperative games you like that you if you play with kids or if you haven't what are some of your favorite co-op games do you and i'll let you know if i think they'd be good for kids or not so the first two i saw mentioned uh red meeple ryan mentioned forbidden desert just before you got to it okay uh, but also uh, brought up forbidden sky which is the See? newer one and unfortunately doesn't look well rated no. No, I, I have not heard anything positive about that game, to be honest. Um, everyone I know says Forbidden Desert's way better than Forbidden Island. The thing is, Forbidden Island's so accessible. That's why I kept it on the list as a kid's game. And if your kids love it and you enjoy it, move up to Forbidden Desert later. Right. Forbidden Sky is not performed well. It's, it's not rated well. Um, it's electronics, like you're hooking things up. So there's electricity involved, which you're playing games with electricity with kids. You may want to avoid. It also seems very breakable because it's all plastic pieces you have to assemble mm. and it's rated bad. So to me, that's kind of three strikes, right? Like that, I, at least for kids, that's another one. If, if the local game store could get a copy in or something and I could sit down and play it, I would love to try it to see why it's rated so badly because the other games are really good. I'll admit Deanna doesn't like them much, but she doesn't like co-op games very much. And one of the things is I don't like playing those games with adults very much because they're terrible for quarterbacking. Right. Like they are very much a, no, no, you move there, you move there, then you do this, then do this. And then on my turn, I'm going to do the thing. And then when it comes back around to me, like that happens in Forbidden Desert and Island all the time. Right. Then it's, it's hard to cut back on because I'll do it. Because if I'm the person who knows the game best, be like no 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 you don't want to go over there because if you go over there that's going to sink next so so that's but i still think for that playing with kids where you want that cooperation it's great but yeah i would skip forbidden sky unless you know better than i do somehow uh ryan ryan's mentioning he lost the game well then he would not like the game extreme because yes. not only did they do a mind extreme which gave you the up and down but they took the game extreme, which our game, which already had up and down and added other rules onto yes. the cards to make it even harder. Yeah. So when you play, you do stuff. But I think uh, instead, Ryan is making a reference to the uh, the meme of I lost the game. Not I don't even know if he's ever actually played the game. <laughs> uh, uh, Ryan's asking Castle Panic over Dead Panic. Well, right there, the theme, right? You're playing with kids. <laughs> I, I guess zombie. if your kids are the older kids are and they're zombies. really into zombies. Sure, but the other thing is Castle Planet has way more expansion. So if you do dig it, there's a lot more you can expand it with. I got to admit, the game does look neat 
with like when you got the catapults and the wizards and like uh, the undead coming in and stuff like so yeah way there it's weird I, I'm, I'm totally okay with castle theme with undead but zombies modern to me seems more horror because that's yeah, the other dead panic is is modern it's right. it's you're held up i don't know if it's at a gas station or whatever but it's a modern place a modern building right with waves of zombies coming in to me that doesn't seem like well i mean they're used to minecraft zombies which has that sort of uh fantasy feel to it right exactly to, to me i i personally think but again it depends on your kids uh, if your kids are into zombies as i mentioned with um with potter if you one of the biggest ways to hook a kid into playing a game is play a game of older thing they already love right yeah. like that's one of the best ways to get them to sit down and play so if they're really into the walking dead or zombies for whatever reason whether it's minecraft or the comic book they're currently reading then dead panic's probably the better choice right uh we have uh brian's interested in advice about ages for the D D adventure begins i don't know if we want to cover that later or cover that now no we might as well cover it now since it was in the the list of recommendations i i hate giving age groups um the whole thing with that game is you could probably play with a six-year-old or a five-year-old because the actual mechanics of the game don't matter which we will get into later um the big thing in that game is open freeform storytelling it is i read a card that says you are standing at a lake and you see a glint out in the lake what do you do to find out what it is and then you just go and i could ask that question of a five-year-old and get a two-hour story out of them and it'd be great and probably an awesome story or i could ask and they go i swim out there and grab it right so at that level any almost any age could play the problem is then I'm going to have them roll a die and tell them what happened, which isn't based at all on the story they just told me, which again, we'll get into that problem with the game later, but it's the, can the five-year-old roll a D20 and tell me what the number means. And then more importantly is if they take damage, are they going to be able to move the tracker and track if they're dead or not, or the ability to use their items to get bonuses probably wouldn't be there. Like my kids at this point are 10 and 13, no problem whatsoever. Like, like not even a little bit. And the youngest does have some learning disabilities and still no problem whatsoever. Like the game worked great at 10 and 13. I think it would work with younger kids. Like I'm, I'm thinking eight is probably, but again, I hate throwing out a number. Right. Uh, Ryan's asking about your thoughts on aftermath. I unfortunately haven't played it. It looks fantastic. So this is the, the latest. Well, I don't know about the latest because for, Forgotten Waters is newer. So one of the, the latest of the storybook games with miniatures, and it's basically you are taking stuff fables and putting it post-apocalyptic. I love the miniatures. I love the fact there's a cat finally because that's something they actually stayed away from in Mice and Mystics. But it seems to be, again, a more adult story. So might be a great follow-up to stuff fables as your kids get older. But again, the theme of Stuff Fables, the whole defend a, a girl going into her big girl bed, right? It's just like every kid gets that, right? Don't like I would think. I, I, I again, I haven't played it. It's, it's on my list of so far I've loved all those, but we haven't actually finished Stuff Fables. So despite the fact I'm telling you how much how great it is, it does require a time investment to play through multiple stories. And we just, my kids are totally obsessed right now with Minecraft and um, Animal Crossing and the Switch and Zelda Breath of the Wild, which they just call Link. <laughs> and getting them to play board games has actually gotten hard, which is disappointing for me. But I, it's at that point where they will play games now and then, but I, especially the youngest will play one round of something and then be like, can I go play something else? So uh, Ryan mentions After Aftermath is nine, the board game. And I don't know if most familiar with that movie, but no. I'd say pretty close. Uh, and with uh, 700 ratings, it's coming in at a 7.9, which, which is, is, is pretty solid. Pretty good. I mean, that's that's uh, that's, a, that's a definitely something I'd be less hesitant to buy uh, seeing numbers like that on ratings. So uh brian anything else about uh candy land not being a game and i i, I agree <laughs> yep yep it is not it is preset it is a good teaching tool as sean points out there you got me to admit it it's yeah. a good game to play with kids to teach them things like taking turns and winning and losing and how to be a good winner and how to be a good loser and things like that though i still think there are better options like hoot owl hoot and to be honest i have not played hoot owl hoot it's just the movement system seems to be based on candy land Right. I am assuming that the deck isn't preset at the beginning of the game so that it's going to play out the same way every time, no matter what. 
Uh, and then we have uh, Ryan talking about Pandemic the Cure. You can have a plan, but the dice ultimately determine your actions. So it yeah, so that's removing the quarterbacking, quarterbacking issue. Now, I you will note there were no pandemic games on the list. I would not it, uh, force any pandemic themed games on my kids probably now for the rest of their life. I would suggest probably not doing that for most parents for the next yeah. 10 years or so. Uh, a little too on the nose, I would think right now. Plus, I actually have always been a bigger fan of games like uh, Flashpoint for that style with action points to go around and clean stuff up on the board. I prefer Flashpoint or Horrified. Uh, and Mountain Pop is asking if Aftermath is the next step to Fables. Uh, officially, the, there are three because it's stuff Fables, then Comanauts, and then Aftermath. Yeah, but they're not. A, they're a, not. A, yeah, they're not an actual progression. That's just the order the 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 designer put them, them out. Yeah. Aftermath, as far as I understand, is a continuation of the Mice and Mystics world more than the other, but I don't know. Right. Um, they're all they're all Jeremy Hawthorne, I think, is the designer. I yes. hope I'm not getting Jer that wrong. Jerry, Jerry Hawthorne. Jerry, say I was close. Jerry Hawthorne is the one that designed them all. Comanauts is is the game with the most weird theme that I have seen in a long time because it's you are a patient is unconscious in a hospital and dreaming in a coma you go into his mind and have to fix him and and, and i'm now, like wow haven't you played in an rpg on that uh that's sort of but not vaguely that. vaguely similar <laughs> there, to there are rpgs with a similar theme but not quite this not right. not fix the person in a coma so they wake up right uh, again that theme right there i'm not playing that with my kids right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah deanna is saying uh, Gizmos is not a cooperative game, Roger. Roger Gizmos is a great game for kids if you want to teach them about it in engine building. But yeah, it, fantastic family family game, but not not the co-op. Yeah, these are all cooperative games. There are a number more. What I couldn't believe is how many cooperative games have now been published for little kids. Um, I, like from Habas for the First Orchard to like I was I, I obviously I do research before these. I found a top fifty list of cooperative kids games the fact there are 50 i was like holy cow um there was one about mermaids uh, again this is uh, the list is skewed a little towards older kids because well my kids have gotten older so fair uh anything else from the chat are we good to go on well, i think we are there sounds good so remember if you have a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop and fill out the form, or send me an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Today we're going to be taking a look at a cooperative board game set in the DC Comics universe, Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Before we get to review the review, we do have to take a moment to thank Ravensburger for providing us with a review copy of this game. Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons was designed by Prospero Hall and features artwork from Jenny Friesen. It's a cooperative card-driven board game for two to five players, with each game taking an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how much planning the players decide to do. This was published in 2020 by Ravensburger and has an MSRP of $44.99 US dollars. In Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons, players each take on the role of one of DC Comics' Amazon characters, including, of course, Wonder Woman herself. Players will use their Amazon to defend the island of Themyscira from an outside threat. Threats included in the base game box include Ares, Circe, and the Cheetah. Gameplay consists of players using cards to program three actions each round. The twist is that players only know what two of the five cards they will get to choose from while discussing plans with the other players. For a look at what you get in the box, be sure to check out our Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons unboxing video on YouTube. In regards to the components in Challenge of the Amazons, I have to say I was mostly impressed. Now, one thing I was a bit disappointed by was the miniatures are plastic and they're painted to look like metal. And the only reason this disappointed me is when looking at pictures of the game, I actually thought it had metal miniatures. So that's my own unreasonable expectation, especially at that price point. But I will admit I was a little disappointed to find they were plastic. Either way, they are really nice looking miniatures with lots of detail, probably take a coat of paint really well. The quality of the rest of the stuff, the cards, the board, the cubes, other components are all excellent. And the game features a really well-designed plastic box insert to hold and keep everything in place. Though if they do ever put out an expansion for this game, I don't think it's going to fit in the base box. The same sort of quality in the box that we've come to expect from a Prospero Hall game. 
So what exactly are we doing with all these components? How does Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons play? First thing you need to do is pick which of the three villains you'll face. So you have Ares, Circe, and the Cheetah. Now each of these villains plays differently and changes the overall feel of the game. Now Ares is considered the easiest to defeat and the rule book is actually written assuming you're fighting Ares on your first play and it doesn't even mention the other gods or enemies, sorry, Cheetah's not really a god, the other enemies until you get further into the rule book where it's like, all right, if you're using these other villains, you do this instead. A nice mix and match way to ensure that you're not stuck playing the same game over and over mm -hmm. while reusing components. Now, once you have a villain, each player is going to pick one of the five Amazons to play. Each has their own unique ability, of course, to make them stand out. The characters include Diana, which is the, the Wonder Woman that everyone should be familiar with, Nubia, Artemis, Mala, and Philippus. Now, each has its own little small player board uh, and uh, with that unique ability listed on it, and basically a spot to place three cards. Doesn't really serve a lot of purpose, like you could probably do without it, but having that reminder of what your power is is nice. Uh, your miniatures are going to be starting on the palace, put it kind of in the center of the board. You're then going to take four random relics and shuffle them into the hero card deck, and then set up the board based on which villain you're playing against. Now, I can't get into the details of this because they're all completely different, so this includes setting your starting defense for Themyscira, the villain's health level, shuffling the appropriate villain deck, every villain has their own, placing a villain standee on the board, which represents where they are, and placing some cubes out on the board. And this is where we start to really see the reuse of materials in action. Yeah. Now, one of the things that gets reused from all of them is that there are plastic cubes, included in the game in four colors. Now, white cubes are always Amazon warriors that you can recruit to aid you in the defense of the island. They are white kind of semi-transparent cubes, good quality. The other three colors, though, which are purple, orange, and green, represent obstacles. And what exact obstacles these are depends completely on which villain you're facing. So for example, if you're facing off against Ares, purple cubes represent corrupted Amazons. Orange cubes are Ares' servants of war, and green cubes are blockades. Now, if you instead you're facing Circe, the same cubes in the same order represent magic beacons, or sorry, magic beacons, wolf Amazons, and pig Amazons. Simple and efficient. Now, no matter what enemy you're facing, the goal of Challenge of the Amazons is always to defeat the villain before the island's defense is reduced to zero. Each round in Challenge of the Amazon is broken into four phases, and here's what happens in each. So at the start of the round, the enemy goes. They act. You're going to draw cards from the enemy deck and move the villain on the board, as well as place one or more obstacle cubes. Now, again, these obstacle cubes could do different things. Like, sometimes they will represent different things and they might replace warrior cubes for example the corruption and so on you'd replace a warrior with a corrupted amazon now depending on what villain you're facing other things may happen is probably the best way i could describe it like cubes on the board may move now again here's an example from one of the three villains which when you're facing Ares, at the end of every villain phase the corrupted amazons the the purple cubes move towards the palace each round the next phase is strategy guys together Players get two hero cards and discuss their plans. Now, each hero card has a thematic name, like nimble, confident, or adaptable. In the next phase, players will receive more cards, and they're going to choose from all of the cards they've gotten to program three of them. So during this planning phase, note you only have two of your five cards, and you have to program three reviews. Or, sorry, three, um, three actions. So you don't have all the information you need to make a perfect plan. There's always some information missing. So this is a great way to help minimize quarterbacking as people will still have to make decisions on their own, regardless of what group decisions are made here in this round. Yes. So the next phase is battle begins. Here's where you decide what your three actions are. So you've discussed your plans. You've got your full hand of cards. You've got to put down three of them on your player board in three spots. One, two, three. Now, the important part here is the players aren't allowed to communicate anymore. No more talking, no more discussing plans. You have to plan out your actions without any outside input, and it's up to each individual player if they're going to follow that plan they just discussed in the last phase, or based on their cards, they may come up with something even more heroic to go do. 
it's always easier to write a rule against table talk than it is to implement it. Very true. I admit that is one of the hardest things while playing this game is to not <laughs> actually give away any information. So now everyone's got everything programmed. You're ready to go. You now take your actions. You now do it, right? You did your plan. Now you do it. You reveal the card in the first slot. Everyone reveals the card in the first slot. And then you're going to take one action based on that card. Once players have taken their first action, then you're going to reveal your second card and everyone takes their second action. And you reveal the third card. Everyone takes the third action. Now, these hero cards are going to feature from one to three icons on them, and they're going to have a rating for that icon from one to four. These icons represent four different things, wisdom, vigor, agility, or leadership. Now, to complete an action, you're going to spend the points from one of these. So even if the card has three icons on it, you only get to use one of the icons on each card. Now, two of the event actions in wonder woman challenge of the amazons are identical it doesn't matter who you're playing off against you can always spend agility to move between regions one point per region or leadership to recruit amazon warriors which are white cubes which we mentioned earlier and but that can only be done on certain points on the map once you've recruited the amazon warriors while you're doing that first move action using agility you can bring the warriors with you which represents your amazon like leading the armies around the map now the remaining actions completely depend on which villain you're facing and completely change. So for example, if you are challenging Ares, you can spend three wisdom to remove a corrupted Amazon from the region you're in. You've convinced the Amazon the error of their ways and they switch back to your side. Or you can spend two vigor to remove a servant of war, which is an orange cube, which obviously you fought or defeated the servant of war. Or you can spend three agility to move a, remove a blockade, which are things Ares is gonna put on the road to make it hard to move around. Or you can spend four of any icon to actually damage Ares by one point. And note, you can put these up higher. So like if you can do six icons, you could, or whatever, six wisdom, you could remove two corrupted Amazons. And if you can manage to get 12 of one symbol somehow, you can damage Ares by four, three. So all in all, a seemingly well-balanced, well-thought-out approach to this co-op that reduces common problems for the genre, while also ensuring that the game doesn't grow stale quickly. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, in addition to this, many of the hero cards have text on them that do things, right? So, for example, I'm not going to remember the exact name of the card, but say, say Vigor may say you can double the value on your Vigor card if it's played in your first slot. And another one may give you a bonus if it's played in the second slot. One of them is if other characters have played the same card in the same phase, all of you double your icons. Or there's another one that doubles all of your allies' stuff if they're in the same region and so on. Now, along with that way to kind of combo together, players can also work together. They can cooperate, or characters can cooperate while the players cooperate using their characters because whenever their miniatures are in the same region, they can combine the values of their symbols to make one big action. And this is useful for getting up to those harder to reach higher totals, especially like trying to damage a villain, like hitting Ares with a 12 wisdom all at once. Finally, we come back to those Amazon warriors that you've recruited and are moving around on the map. Anytime taking any action, you can spend Amazon warriors. You just take one and remove it from the game and then get a bonus to one, whatever symbol. And it can be any of the symbols in the game. So you can push up, bump up your, your special actions. If during this action phase, you manage to reduce the villain's health to zero, the players win. Certainly no confusion over your in game conditions. Then you get to the final end of round. If you haven't won the game yet, the enemy attacks. The island's defense is reduced based on which villain you're facing, and that is driven by what obstacles are on the board and where they are on the board. So again, I'm going to use Ares because that's the basic game as the example. Your group's going to lose one defense for every region with Servant of War in it. Doesn't matter how many in each region, just each region that has a servant of war, that's one defense down. You're going to lose two defense for each corrupted Amazon that's made it to the palace. And you're going to lose three defense for any region that has five or more obstacles in it. If Themyscira's defense rating hits zero, the players lose the game. And the enemy doesn't move again after the beginning of the turn, so you've had that whole round to know mm -hmm. where these attacks are going to take place. Yeah, there's a lot of tactics and strategy there planning how to make sure you lose the least defense at the end of the round. Now, in addition to this, uh, being a card-driven game, there are, of course, some exceptions. Um, there are a number of special rules, depending on which villain you're facing. 
For example, each time you actually hit Circe, she summons magical lanterns onto the board and those increase her defense. There are lots of these little exceptions. Now, along with the action cards, uh, there's something I mentioned right at the beginning of the game, you're gonna seed the deck with four relics. When one of these relic cards comes up, the player gets a choice. They can just discard it and draw another card. So keep just taking more actions or they can choose to discover the relic. When they do that, you're gonna put a token on the board based on what location it says on the relic. Then if later anyone moves on to that region, they get a chance to pick up this token and then claim the relic. Now, each of these relics breaks the rules in some way. For example, the Girdle of Gaia lets you double the symbols on a nimble card, which is one of the different power card types. The Lasso of Truth lets you move obstacles with you as you move around the bat, which is really handy for herding pigs when fighting Circe. Because who isn't thinking about herding pigs when you're getting ready to delve into the DC mythos? Ah, definitely fits. Play continues round after round until either the defense of Themyscira falls to zero and the players lose, or until the players win by reducing the players' health to zero. Or sorry, not the players, the villains' health to zero. Note there is no way for your individual characters to die here. That is not a thing. You are it's the island's defense level. If your group's finding the game too easy, uh, each villain also offers a difficult mode with an increased starting health. Now that we have a good idea of how to play, what did you think of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons? I really wasn't sure what to expect from this game when it showed up. Uh, with all the buzz around Prospero Hall, like everywhere I am hearing Prospero Hall and the huge success they've had with some of their games, like Horrified and Disney Villainous and Hogwarts Battle, I just expected to hear a lot more about this game. Instead, there's like no buzz at all. Like the big tabletop gaming podcasts I listened to. If they mentioned it, it was only in passing. And I don't really see anyone talking about it on social media. I don't see it popping up in my Instagram feed or anything like that. And now that I've played it, I'm kind of confused because this is a really solid game. It features excellent production values. That would have been nicer with metal minis, but a great rule book, engaging gameplay with lots of replayability. Yeah, so there was a burst of buzz upon release. I remember seeing it scroll past on Twitter, uh, I assume from their go-to reviewers who handle all that hot new newness, but then within a day or two, nothing. Yeah. And sadly, what seems like a solid game has already, I believe, been seen discounts. Yeah, it is uh, seen quite deep discounts, to be honest. It, it seems to be readily available. Like I said, I, I don't know. I don't know why this one just faded from prominence. Um, one of the features that impressed me the most is uh, the thing we mentioned a couple times here is the reuse of components to change the feel of the game. Like each of the three villains uses those obstacle cubes in totally unique ways. And I think that's brilliant. And as we mentioned, this isn't just like a surface retheme or name changes. The game plays significantly different. Like we talked about how with Ares, you're running around the board, battling servants of war and trying to convert Amazons back to your side. And Ares is throwing up blockades. Whereas when you're playing Circe, you've got these magic beacons that keep showing up that buffer and you like almost impossible to damage her while they're up on the board. And now going back to those pigs Sean was talking about, well, the whole story with Circe is she's showing up and she's transmuting some of the Amazons into pigs and other Amazons into wolves. And while the whole thing and the way you lose defense is if they end up in the same region, you have the wolves eating the pigs, which is actually a pretty twisted plot twist. Um, and I think that's fascinating. Like I am so impressed by how the same set of components leads to such a variety in play. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, uh, they've, they've really maximized the use of what they have in the game to, to give you as much as you can in yeah. what isn't a, you know, a giant gloomhaven sized box or anything. No, not at all. This is a, a standard Ravensburger box size. The other thing, too, that hasn't happened yet, and hopefully, I have a feeling won't because of the fact that this game's kind of fallen out of prominence, it would be so easy to expand this. Like, you could so easily just have a villain pack that has an oversized tarot-sized card with the new villain rules and a small pack of cards with it. It's standy, and that's it. That's all you need. And then you have a completely new villain to face in, in Wonder Woman. Now, I also really like what the game's done to reduce the chances of quarterbacking. 
Now, we use this term a lot, but I'll define it just in case you don't know it. So quarterback is when one player takes over for the whole group, right? And it's something that happens in cooperative games where the player who knows the most or knows the games the most or at least thinks they do kind of tells all the other players what they should be doing and takes over their turns. This is something that can be a huge problem in any cooperative game. However, the way the challenge of the Amazon presents the players with incomplete information during the phase where you're actually allowed to talk pretty much eliminates the ability to take over and guide another player's action. Now that said, I have seen some people on social media mainly point out that they don't like that imperfect information. They don't like only having two of their cards out of three when they're trying to plan and strategize. They want to be able to make a definite plan and don't like it when the group plans one thing and one of the players ends up doing something else because of the cards they've drawn. Now, personally, in the games I played, I love it. I think it's a positive feature. I love it when I come up with something even better than what we planned. Like oh, I said, I was going to do that, but man, I drew a whole bunch of plus three cards. Instead, I'm going to go go give Ares a beating instead of you know just clearing out some wolves or whatever. I, I think it's great, but I can see how other groups might find this to, to not be to their taste, like potentially even going to the so far as find a flaw in the game. So I got to say, if someone doesn't like this aspect, like it's a pretty easy house rule. Just allow open communication during the battle begins phase. Yeah, it sounds like some quarterbacks just don't like having their power removed. Huh. If they're that possible. desperate, there are always ways around it. That is possible. That could be those type of players. I don't know. Now, another complaint I have seen about this game is that people have been finding the difficulty too high. Um, I don't know what it is. Maybe we're just really good or what, but this isn't something we've experienced ourselves. Uh, it seems just about right. Everything feels kind of tense, and we've managed to win a number of times. I, I'm wondering if people are thinking of this as a gateway game. As a, it's Wonder Woman, it's DC Comics, it'll be light and fun, let's play it with the kids, right? And I'm wondering if the group's board game experience is impacting that difficulty level because this is not a light gateway cooperative game this is not as simple and easy to understand as pandemic or flashpoint fire rescue or forbidden desert this is this is almost closer to gloomhaven jaws of the lion level of trying to plan out your turn using cards which is why i think of it like gloomhaven now it's not gloomhaven it's not like I would call Gloomhaven heavy at times, but to, to win a scenario in Gloomhaven takes some work and cooperation. It's not quite there, but it is a significant step above your gateway cooperative games. And this game has a bit of a learning curve and that curves repeated every time you try a new villain because the game plays so different and figuring out what actions to do where and when and how to utilize your relics and maximize the use of each character's unique power is going to be a key to winning. And that's not something that's obvious, especially during your first couple plays. Yeah, I, I was in a discord recently and there are people out there who are saying that they're, they have played with groups who are expecting 80% win with a co-op oh or they think it's broken. Uh, now, I'm not sure what to say to those people, because if you're winning more than half of your co-op games, I think that's the game that's broken. Um, I, I think that's where the game is broken. Uh, you shouldn't be winning 80% of your games um, with a, with a well-balanced game for me. Yeah, because to me, one of the big draws of a co-op game and what sells it is that near win. And this is the one thing that I think Pandemic did perfectly is I can't play one game of Pandemic because assuming I didn't win. Like Pandemic's a terrible experience. If you play Pandemic for the first time and you win, you'll never go back. You'll hate Pandemic for the rest of your life. You'll be like, why? What's the buzz? What's the hype? But if you come two or three card draws away from winning, you're immediately like, oh, it was so close. Let's try again. And then you'll try again and it'll get so close. And you're like, oh, we almost got it. Let's play. And that's the brilliance of that game. And that's what brings people back to it. And that is where you don't want that high win percentage. Whereas I've seen people comparing this to ghost stories, which I think is in the opposite, where you only win like 10 or 15% of the time. And that's pushing it too far. So like I said, I haven't experienced it. I don't know what we've done right uh, or maybe we just got really lucky. Um, one of the things, like, for example, when fighting seriously, if you can get the lasso, the lasso's in play, your chance to win jumps up huge because you can move those obstacle cubes around with you. So it lets you herd the wolves or the sheep. That's a huge ability. If you don't have that card, that fighting seriously is going to be way more difficult. Now, of course, the key to that is one of the heroes you can pick increases your odds of getting that rope because one of the heroes starts with a set of artifacts and gets to pick one. And then the odds of that 
particular thing being the deck helps, but that's what I mean about being an experienced player and knowing the game, helping up that win difficulty. So moving away from difficulty, overall, I got to say, I was very pleasantly surprised by Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Uh, this is one of the better cooperative games I've played. It does an amazing job of eliminating the alpha gamer problem or the quarterbacking uh, that many cooperative games have through the use of a very unique program movement system. You've got great replayability, uh, three different villains with different challenge levels that brilliantly uses the same components in different ways to create three rather varied gameplay experiences. Now, the one thing Challenge of the Amazons is not is a gateway game. This is not your first cooperative game, my first cooperative game. This is a cooperative board game for experienced gamers who are used to planning their actions together and working together and strategizing and having long-term plans. While Wonder Woman Challenge the Amazons isn't a game I'd break out with a new group of gamers, even if they are hardcore Wonder Woman fans, it's a great game for groups who already have some cooperative gaming experience and are looking for a new challenge. Now, it's going to go over even better if those groups are fan of DC Universe and, of course, Wonder Woman. All right. Well, when you have time, be sure to also check out our written review of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons over at TabletopBellhop.com. Review in the final part of the show. Were there any comments in the chat room for that review? Uh D and I were talking about MSRP and but uh, so yeah uh, we could talk about this now though you might want to cut this from the YouTube version of the review um we talked about it I'm like I think I, a couple podcasts I've been listening to have included the MSRP and I thought it was worth putting out there because a lot of people are going to base their decision to buy a game or not based on the cost and if I reviewed this game and I said it was an $89 game I wouldn't be interested I think it'd be a terrible price point whereas it's a $50 game you're like and it has miniatures and cubes it sounds more reasonable I think it's an important aspect of the game now I was not able to follow along because I tried for a second there and that was dumb while I was talking <laughs> and I made a slight mess up in there so so my my thoughts are, uh, if we were doing the hot new hotness, absolutely, we should you a hundred percent be throwing MSRP in there. But the problem is when we're doing a review, even a year out, um, that if it's out of print, it's going to be three times MSRP. No one will ever find it. And if it's if it's this game, then all of a sudden this is now a thirty five dollar game instead of a fifty dollar game because it didn't get the buzz and hit discount. So. That, that that MSRP uh, to me after about six months is is useless. So I don't know. I think the MSRP is still useful because then when people do go look for it and find it's ninety dollars, they go, "Whoa, this might be out of print. Maybe I shouldn't pay ninety dollars for it." Or they look and they go, "Holy cow, it's twenty bucks." I think this is useful. Yeah, we don't. Sure. I don't. I, I definitely think having the MSRP, the original sticker price, the suggested retail is useful. It, it, as Deanna says, like it's a measuring stick. It's a yeah, I, I if mean, if I now go on Amazon and I go to buy Wonder Woman, it says eighty dollars. Well, I just listen to Mo's review. It's supposed to be a fifty dollar game. What's going on? Or I go to Amazon and notice it's currently like seventeen dollars, which is probably I think about what it is right now. Like holy cow, that's a good deal, and I buy it, even if it is three years from now. Yeah, I I, I guess I don't know. I don't know. To me, it seems like a good measuring stick. Yes, no, I mean I, we I'm, do. I'm I'm well aware that the the prices change constantly. Um, and the, the, I just, I don't know. All right. Well, it's something we can definitely, yeah, I, yeah, I'd love to guys... hear from people listening. Um, yeah. if you're listening to this podcast, well, we might cut, well, this will be in the full podcast episode, right? Yeah. Yeah. We can leave this in the full podcast. I, I don't think this belongs with the review. No, we can cut <laughs> it out for the review version, but for, for the, the purpose, if you have an opinion, do you want to hear the MSRP? Like personally, I'm putting the MSRP in us dollars and I'm Canadian. So right there, it's kind of pointless, but I do know most of the people who listen to the show are American. Yeah. I, I just, I, it, to me, the MSRP, I mean, again, it, you never see things at the MSRP. So. Yeah. But I think everyone knows that. Yeah, yeah. Like I think anyone shopping for board games, listening to our show knows you don't pay MSRP for games unless you're buying them the day they come out or buying them at a con yeah. or whatever. Right. Like, unless it's the new hotness and that's the price. But yeah, I would love to know if people want it or not. Like it was one of those things I was writing the review today and I'm like, why don't we include that? Now I had the dice tower. What they do is they give the current going price. And yeah, they're based on two but... specific sites. So they give you the U.S. price from Cool Stuff Inc. and the Canadian price from Board Game Blitz. Right. And that to me sounds terrible because oh, yeah. they have sales and stuff all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. All I, right. So we have we have Ryan says I don't need to know about it from us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most people who listen who who are going board game shopping know how to get a good price on something. Um so while yes, I can see that that there, you know, there's the the there's that the the you know measuring stick idea, but realistically I don't know. See, the other thing too is I am thinking also that this goes on the blog and people can see it right there and then they click on the picture of the game beside it and see the actual price they can buy it at. And 99% of the time that's lower. Right. So as far as us trying to market to people and sell stuff with affiliate links, yeah, I mean, plus that, at the bottom yeah, of the that's, page, that's there's the going to other... be a thing that shows us. Yeah, yeah. And that's that. That's way outside of my... Uh... Yeah, the problem is I don't want to do US and Canadian. We don't have enough Canadian viewers for that. Plus Canadian MSRP is are weird sometimes, which... All right, we're not having another coffee break, so yep. I think we are good to move on. But yeah, let us know. Uh, where the heck are we? All right, there we are. Tabletop Gaming Weekly. Moving on. Uh, do, do, do. And now the Bellhops Tabletop. We look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, we got a lot to talk about this week in our weekend review. Uh, the most we've had this uh, this section in over a year, actually, at this point. Um, now, a small part of this is due to the fact we didn't record last week, but mainly uh, it's because Sean was staying at my place for a few days and we took the chance to get in a bunch of gaming. But before we get to that, let's start off with a couple weeks ago. So I finally got some unboxing videos done and due to that was able to get in some plays of our Xmas and uh, birthday games that we got. And now the first ones we played were Reef and Unfair. I'm going to say those for a bit because we also played those with Sean. So I'd rather hear us both talk about the game at the same time. So we're going to save that for later. What I am going to talk about, though, is Dungeons and Dragons Adventures Begins. So this is a new board game from Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast that is meant to be a new player's introduction to Dungeons and Dragons. Now, this is for the mass market. This is for the average person on the street to stumble into Dungeons and Dragons. This is a game you should be able to find at Walmart and Target and toy stores, as well as hobby and specialty shops. Like they really put this out here and it's at a super low price point for what it is. And really, they're trying to hit the widest market they possibly can. Though beware, QC seems a little weak uh, since you did get one with a missing part. Uh, have uh, you heard back from them regarding that yet? It's been a week now. So all over the Hasbro website, there's a list of games they support and you have this thing, you fill it and you drop down and you select the game. It's not there. So then they send you over to the Wizards of the Coast site. You go to the Wizards of the Coast site and the Wizards of the Coast site sends you to the Dungeons Dragons site. It's there listed as a Dungeons and Dragons game. So then I contact the Dungeons and Dragons support, wait three days for them to write back and say, no, this game falls under our Hasbro brand, get a hold of Hasbro. Uh, so then I wrote an email to Hasbro and I haven't heard anything back because Hasbro doesn't have a part replacement form to fill out, but they would love me to call their 1-800 number. And I just hate talking to people on the phone. So I haven't done that yet. Um, so I don't know. I, I, no one that left hand right hand going on with this particular so game no real one, customer service issues there unfortunately yeah yeah it's that's hasbro i don't think anyone has pleasant customer experience this is a game that if i bought it at walmart i would return it to walmart at this point and right. just get another copy yeah the problem is i bought it on amazon and i would have to package it up and ship it and shipping right now means going to the drugstore and i don't really want to go to the drugstore in the middle of a pandemic even though they are officially open so no i haven't well, i have heard back from from watsi uh right. dungeon and dragons but i have not heard back from hasbro at this point we're just probably going to sub a mini, but when I played, we played three players. So it didn't matter. No one got to play green. <laughs> so the copy of adventure begins. We have, excuse me, was, I just mentioned ordered online. And it was a Christmas gift for my youngest Gigi. And I got to say, I, I think I mentioned this on the show. I can't remember. I was talking to Sean when she opened it. She just kind of looked at it and I'm like, it's a new Dungeons and Dragons game. And she was like, like she had no clue what D&D was and I'm like wow I failed as a parent my kid doesn't know what D&D is though she's role played and knows what dice are it's just like like she had no clue which I'm like okay I guess I, like I, I'm thinking about it I'm like no it's not like I played D&D &D when they came over and when we were playing D&D &D in the basement we just called it the role-playing friends the role-playing friends came over 
So somehow I somehow failed as a as a dungeon master in introducing my kids to the brand. So we need to, we need to get them sit down in front of the TV and watching the old uh, show. I've, I've got it. I've yeah, got it on I, DVD. I'm, yeah, yeah. We got to pop those DVDs in there and let them see. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they would go well over that show. Well, anyway. So she had no clue what D&D is. Uh, now, note this has changed since then. She's actually part of a Dungeon Dragons club at school now. Um, and part of that was that her lack of enthusiasm vanished once we started playing the game. Like, she immediately got into it. Now, this game's messed up. Like, it, I, I don't even know how to describe this thing. So it is a board game. This is not really a role-playing game, I guess. Because you have a board, so we have four boards, and you have miniatures that you're going to move on them, and you got D20s and D10s, and you got like trays to hold components, and you got cards and decks you have to shuffle. But it also is a super improv RPG, like like more so than the story games that Jeff Seuss loves, who's not in our chat room tonight. But anyone who knows Jeff knows what I'm talking about. Like 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 we're talking past the stick style level of role playing, and. You do some D&D things, like you start by making a character, uh, but you do this by making a character screen out of three cardboard parts, right? You have a race class and a personality type card with a special ability on it and a set of attacks. And there's two options for each of these, and there's actually four different character colors. And you can't mix and match the character colors, but like that's, I, I don't know what the, I could do the math, but I'm not going to do it two to the power of eight or whatever it is. A lot of different possible combinations. You then pick one of the four baddies to face, um... This is similar to Wonder Woman we talked about earlier, where the, the baddie's going to determine some of the rules of the game, like which map you're going to fight on last, that, that you have to explore last. Um, it also gives you a bunch of henchmen, and you're going to put a henchman at the end of every other map, and there's a total of four maps. Um, then to play, you put your minis on the first part of the map, and you pass the Dungeon Master around. And you have this little tray to hold it. Like there's this Dungeon Master tray that holds your D10 and it holds this little clip for tracking hit points. And you slide the deck of cards in it. And then you literally draw the top card and put it facing up so that only the other players can see the picture on it, which I thought was really neat. So you're sitting there and the other players can see the picture of what's happening. And then the DM reads it off and the, you do something, right? So... I, the DM, like, like, it may say you're traveling down the road when suddenly it starts to rain. The rain gets harder and harder. What do you do to find cover? And then all the players going around would describe what they do. Like, this is pure improv. There, there's no wrong. There's no right answer. There's no looking at your skills and your character sheet. I, you just come up with a story, including the person playing the DM. But none of it matters. No matter what you say, you're going to roll a die and the DM reads out what happens. I might be you rolling the die. It might be the DM rolling that D10. Um, and then usually you're going to get some kind of bonus if you rolled high, like, oh, you found treasure, you get gold, or you're going to get a penalty if you roll bad, like you lose an item or you lose hit points. I mean, props for pushing narrative play. And it's great to get kids interested in that whole improv storytelling point. But no reinforcement whatsoever none none at all and it even combat's the same so in combat you could just roll the dice every character has an attack that if you roll five or higher in d20 does one damage and if you roll i think it's 18 or higher you do two it might be 16 or higher i forget the exact number then they have another attack that automatically does oh no sorry it's five or higher to do one damage then they have a second attack that's 12 or higher and you do two damage or you have the cool attack that has a range of things that can happen that has the best probability of doing something good. Well, to do that, you have to describe what you do. And it specifically says using items on your equipment cards for inspiration. And your character also has like personality types on this character sheet you built. So you're supposed to use all this to tell this awesome story about how your thief did a sneak attack. But then it, it doesn't matter. You roll a d20 and see if you did damage. But that's it. Roll a d20. And then you got a little tracker to track the hit points. So murder hobo training 101, but with detailed narration? <laughs> well, depending on the group, there might not be detailed yeah. narration. That sneak attack could be, I shoot my crossbow at his back. <laughs> yeah. I roll my d20. Like, uh, it's it's so weird. Like, I, I don't even know what to think of this game. It's so unique. But I got to say, my girls loved it. Now, the thing is, though, I've played actual RPGs with my girls, uh, some pretty 
story heavy games like pure improv games like the original mermaid adventures not the pip system version the original version which was roll a bunch of white dice and black dice and if you got more white than black you, you do whatever the hell you were telling sorry whatever you were trying to say i and i just think uh, and my girls have played tales of equestria which is actually a fairly crunchy my little pony game right they've had the game it they 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 know rpgs so they knew what to expect with dungeons and dragons so they were great. Like I, I tell my youngest, describe how you get a sneak attack. And she's talking about climbing up on trees and setting ambushes and wait for it to pass, shooting it with his arrow and all this stuff. And my other daughter is, is bringing things to life with prestidigitation and tying people up. And it was great. But I worry with the wrong group that this will like just flat, complete garbage. Yeah, I mean, I, like the, the narration part is what makes the game fun, right? Yeah. The and storytelling. I'm unfortunately there are groups out there who don't care about the narration they just want to roll to hit the person with the sword yeah. and they're just going to say i swing my sword roll the dice and they're happy with that now, well, unfortunately that's great if you are a grown-up who wants to play that type of game yeah but if you're introducing someone to a game that's problematic See, the thing is it would work right there isn't much there like, like uh, mechanically, you have that player, and the players have that option. It's right on their cart. You can do this attack. If you roll five or higher, you do one damage. Or you can do this attack where you roll 12 or higher, you do two. You could totally ignore all the narration and just go around and roll the dice. It's just, it's a dice chucker. Yep. Uh, but then I think about it. I'm like, wait, this game says D&D on the cover. Does this feel or look like D&D? And I'm like, uh, to be honest, I've been in a D&D group where all I did was roll the dice and tell the player how much damage I did. I gotta admit, I didn't have much fun. Like D&D itself is very group dependent. So in a way, I kind of think it does represent D&D pretty well. I just wish there was more in the book to teach you to play it better, like to coach players or to teach what the DM should be doing. But then you're getting into a full RPG and not a board game. Like, I, I honestly don't know what to think about this box. Yeah, it's one of those, it's you are going to get the experience that is set up for you. So whoever is hosting this experience is going to push children one way or another. Uh, and unfortunately, if you don't have a coordinator or an organizer who is willing to encourage the storytelling aspects mm -hmm. versus the mechanical aspects, they're going to get a very specific view of D and D and not, necessarily the best one yeah all right up next we'll get to the games we both played so first thing we played when sean was down these might i think these are in order problem is board game geek list plays by date and they kind of mish them in so these, these might not be in the exact order we played in not that that actually matters uh but one of the games we played was fun fair that's with an f um i think i personally said enough about this game during a review a couple weeks back so i will just say here my thoughts haven't changed my opinion of the game hasn't changed uh we're loving this game it's super tight super quick and it just feels like a bigger game than it is like when you finish you feel like you've accomplished something you feel like you played a heavy euro despite playing a quick playing card game what do yeah. you think of fun Fair? no i was i was very pleasantly surprised uh, I wasn't, I wasn't missing any sort of take that aspect. Uh, I wasn't, it, it really wasn't missing anything. It was a really solid game that just played out in about the time you expected you. Yeah. You could have done a couple of more things. And that's that feeling you want at the end of the game mm -hmm. where, Oh, if I only had that one extra, but you didn't. So yep. there you go. That's what you're, that's what you're left with. Uh, and that once that, that gets you wanting to play it again, another time to maybe do something a little different and get that extra something next time. Great. So, uh, yeah, no fun fair is definitely, uh, a, a solid play. Happy to. Yeah. So next we followed up with unfair. That's with you. So you don't get those two games confused. Now this is now the next step up from fun fair, even though technically it came out well before back in 2017. Now I have played a handful of games of unfair, and so far, it's living up to the hype I've seen about it. Uh, it's definitely heavier, more complicated, longer, more cutthroat, and nastier than Funfair. I was surprised by just how much more this game is. Like, just 
uh, there's just more decision points and more things to think about and more of an economy and uh, there's loans and there's no outside benefactor donating money and you have events to deal with and you you have city events that turn nasty halfway through and then there's the whole combining of different theme decks and some of the theme decks have their own special rules in them it's just it's more it's so much more than funfair yeah absolutely and this is where i <sighs> I'm I'm actual I I loved Funfair. Funfair was great, but I'm almost hesitant to go back to it because mm-hmm. Unfair is a better, more full game. Now I say that, but we also aren't take that players. We aren't the kind True. of people who love the aggressive get them type game. And so the way the three of us were playing Unfair wasn't as hardcore mess with your neighbor for because mm. like, i miss i can't use the, the word i want to say um, <laughs> yeah. as, as as some groups would be and so i think given the tendencies of some other players i might prefer to jump over to funfair to avoid some yes. of the the nastiness but mm-hmm. in a group of of good friends who are willing to you know mess with someone else once in a while but not just constantly hammer on them Unfair is the better game. It's just meatier. It's got more to it. There's more things to think about and worry about and, and, and strategies. And then combined with all the different decks, you know, I've only seen three of them so far and they're very, they play very differently just yes. between those. So the idea of even more possibilities and mix ups uh, is really intriguing and interesting. See what I found with unfair is the more I play it, the more I like it with that last game with you being the the most enjoyable so far. I gotta admit the first time I played, I got totally hosed by some negative events and it made the game unfun, uh, especially after playing fun fair later games though, knowing what's out there, the kind of things that can happen, what you get penalized for, why you might want to build up a bigger than 15 park, that there's a good reason for that. The stuff you can do to mitigate the chances of the same thing happening made it, a lot more enjoyable, which I think the secret to enjoying fun fair is knowing the cards, knowing the combos, knowing what's going to happen, knowing now not only which cards are in each deck, but also how many, because that way you don't spend the entire game yeah. searching for one card only to find out that someone already built into the park because it was only one in the deck. And also knowing which event cards you should hold for defense and when they're safe to play for your own benefit based on what cards are out there. So I think there's definitely an experience curve in unfair that isn't there. Like fun fair is fun your first game and it's fun your 10th game. Whereas yeah. unfair, I think you need to get it. You need to give it the, you, you, it's like watching Star Trek, the next generation. You got to get to season two, at least before you give up. Cause you got to fight through that beginning and learning curve. And there's, there's especially an aspect of learning who to play things against. You know, if you yep. are going to mess with someone, it's a huge difference between who you're playing on. And, and there can be some real uh, massive swings depending on whether you play it on person X or person Y mm-hmm. um, and, and where that, how that takes things and where that goes and how much it hurts them versus, uh, you know, hurts you or helps you yep. or, or what. And, and again, that changes again with every deck because there's different ways and means of hurting people and helping yourself in each of those decks so another thing we we should try at some point is there is uh what they call the uh, rule breaker i can't remember what they're called unfair features a set of cards that modify the rules of the game like the core rules of the game it even includes a kid's version which all you use are the ride cards and it's a race to who can build the first ride that that's 10 high it sounds completely different style of game built right into the box. Well, one of these is the world peace version. And in that, it removes all that take that own. Right. And it removes the negative events. And I'm wondering if that might be a better game to play with the people who don't like PvP than jumping back down to Funfair. Right. But I have to try it. I haven't tried it yet, so I can't talk to if it will be. At some point, I do want to try that kids version. That was something I noticed the last time I played, I read that. And I'm like, oh, that would be such a different game. Like you literally remove out everything that's not a ride. And it's just about who can build the, the, the best part quick enough. And you get three times your income every round okay. so that you can afford to do it. So it sounds like it's going to be like a 15, 20 minute build a theme park with your kids kind of game. 
again, out of the same box with that super cutthroat two hour long battle Royal from the same box set, which I think is kind of cool. Cool. So up next, we come to uh, what I think is the most unique deck building game I've ever seen. Uh, this is Scott Pilgrim's precious little card game. And when I say unique, I mean unique. Like, like not only does this game have two-sided cards, like right there, like I'm not talking like card and a card back, but like there's two different things on every card and you use both sides. And like when stuff's in the market, there are cards that let you flip them so you can see the other side. And before you put them in the market, you get to pick which side. And then your first round of cards, because you have two hands, you play a hand and then you flip your cards over and potentially play another hand. And then there's like a video game, like uh, Street Fighter combo system, because every card has like an up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA start, which require way too big a hand. Then that determines how much damage you do. And then there's a whole drama system where you have these useless drama cards in your deck, unless you're playing certain characters, because some characters want more drama in their lives and thrive on it. And other characters want less. Like there's just so much going on in this game. And on top of that, there's the whole meta concept of scott pilgrim and the movies and the comics uh and knowing that is definitely an advantage now apparently mo has seen the movie but it didn't just, stick uh i've watched it you know it's one of those movies i'll throw on at least once a year uh so i'm much more familiar with it and i recognize the characters as they're playing and understand a little bit of why knives might want drama but uh you know little uh, neil might not uh and things like that so there's, there's a meta aspect that you don't need to have. I mean, what was, no. I think you were able to play the game oh, definitely yeah. enough, but it adds a little bit extra to it and may help with a little bit of strategy as you went on. I, I, again, we didn't really get into it deeply enough for me to know for sure, but uh, it's, it is definitely an intriguing concept. And the, the yeah. deck cycling was, I have never seen a game cycle decks like that. No, you spend a lot of time shuffling in yeah. that game. <laughs> a lot of time shuffling. Because yeah, not only gonna use... are you going to go through your deck twice each turn, your opponent's possibly going to flip up one to five cards as well. Yeah, so I mean, there's a there's a possibility that in a game where you're not getting that many cards, you're going to burn through 12 to 15 cards every turn. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, as for my thoughts on this game, I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I really don't. It's so weird. Like it's fiddly. Like there, there's a lot going on. You got three different resources. Your character can only use two of them. Um, but you got the two sided cards and trying to remember what's on the other side of the cards, even though it's a reminder. But and then there's the whole combo system. And do you buy cards to fit your combo? And there's battling. I don't know. Like like it's so. For one thing, I admire it. I got to say, like, it's doing something different, which is great to see. I always appreciate seeing a game doing something new, especially with a now tried and true mechanic like deck building. Doing something new with deck building impresses me enough right there. And there's a part of me that kind of wants to say, eh, I tried it. It was neat. It's a little fiddly. Eh, I'll go play something else. Like, I'd, I'd still prefer my core worlds and my uh, uh, race for the, no, not race for the guy that's not a deck builder, clank, whatever. <laughs> But then there's another part of me that kind of wanted to deep dive this. Cause like we only scratched the surface. Oh, like we weren't coming up with strategies or combos or any of that. We just kind of bought the cards that made the most sense. And I kind of want to deep dive how these mechanics work together and learn to play the game good instead of just kind of fumbling through. Uh, I would say that if you enjoy deck builders and you are a Scott Pilgrim fan, oh. go out and buy it. Just, just go out and buy it right away. Uh, if you like unique Deck builders, there's probably something there for you unless you are really against the Scott Pilgrim aesthetic and 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 thing. You know that may that may not be your vibe, and I and for that you know just step away and that's fine. But uh, if you don't mind the Scott Pilgrim uh, aesthetic and you are looking for a what is absolutely for for me a unique deck builder, then again this is a you know go out and buy. All right, the next one I introduced Sean to was Reef. Uh, this is another one that I mentioned. I played some games the week previous. I've been playing this with uh, with my daughters as well as my wife and all four of us even. And I am digging this game. This is an abstract strategy game from the team that brought us to Zool, but it's even lighter and easier to explain than Azul, but still features some really engaging gameplay. Now in Reef, you're building a coral reef out of four different colors of plastic reef pieces, which on their own are really cool. They remind me of like a preschool toy. Um, they're stacked on a four by four grid. 
each turn, you're going to take a new card or play a card. When you play a card, you're going to add two new reef pieces to your board based on what reef pieces are at the top. And then you score the bottom part of your card, which will give you points based on how often the pattern on the card is on your reef. And that's all from like top down. So you're looking down on your reef to score your points. I'm really digging this. My kids are loving it, especially my oldest is really obsessed with it. But Deanna thought it was just okay. What do you think of Reef? Uh, I, it was interesting. Now, we only played two player, and I think that actually may color things a little more. Um, I, I think it's not quite as tight as two player. Uh, I think in a when if you get more players there, the the cycling of the mm. um, the store market. Uh, the market makes it much more interesting because you can't think far as far ahead because the market's more likely to change. Whereas the market, you know, there's three cards out. I think it was, you're yep. only able to grab one. So I, I know that there's pretty good odds of, I can, you know, I can plan for things like that. Um, I, again, I enjoyed it. I don't think it really soars at two. Um, although it was fun. Um, I, I'd rather do an Azul, but uh, yes, it was definitely enjoyable. Yeah, so I think I'm going to love this one once we get back out to public play again. It, it's got the table presence, and it's going to be great for those gateway gamers where even as well might be a little too difficult, especially yeah, the know I would love to sit down with four random people at a, at a game night and, yeah. and, you know, have some fun with it. So we finished off that night of gaming with some letter jam from Check Games Edition. Uh, that was after finding out one division doesn't drop on Disney until 3 a.m. here in Ontario. Uh, this is a very cool uh, letter, we're guessing, game. I, I, I don't even know quite how to describe it. It's, it's like a mashup of Hanabi and Scrabble. So each player has five cards in front of them with five letters on them. You start with one of them face up, but facing the other players, not you. So only, only you, the other players can see yours. And then you can see five other letters, no matter how many people you're playing with. Now, the goal is players are going to give out one word clues uh, based on spelling things with the letters they can see. And then the players who didn't give the clue are going to try to use that clue to guess what their letters are. I, I hope that makes some sense because this is not easy to describe. Then at the end of the game, if every player has figured out their five letters and is able to spell a word with them, they more or less win. Like the, there's a little more to it, but that's the kind of gist. And I got to say, this is like the, the heaviest word game I played because it can be quite brain burning. And it's not just about spelling the longest word. Like you would think the longest word's the best. But you know, if you can hold a two or three letter word that, instantly gives away the player's letter that's a better clue than that huge word that might be ambiguous yeah there's it's it's interesting because one thing is uh and, and one thing that's actually really hard with the game is the the limitations on table talk yeah. that are there um and i think they're important it's it's va very valid that they're there um but it's really hard to play the game without describing some of the things that you're not allowed to describe. Um, I would say that describing this game, and I think we haven't reviewed this yet, and I think it's going to be a tough one when we get there because it is a game that really does sort of need to be seen. I don't know yeah. how to really describe this. I'm going to have to, to think and see if I could adequately describe it. Um, I think what's sort of most fun but also hurting this game a lot is the scoring um or lack yeah, thereof and that's one thing that pointless. really hurts the game i think in a in a gamer's setup it's fine if you're doing a just a party game where no one really cares about the score anyway but for gamers scoring is important and yeah. this game really drops the ball on that I got to say, this is not the first party game that I will throw out the scoring completely <coughs> to illustrations <clears throat> or <coughs> concept, <laughs> or I could probably keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not the first one. Yeah, that score, I don't even know. Like, I had to look up the scoring. That was the one part of the game I didn't remember. And, and, we th like, and I think we still got it wrong because technically I accidentally I your word built counted. a French word um, completely That's one thing by I do accident. like in that game. This is the most re unrestricted for what word you want to use. If you think it's a word, it's a word. Right. That could be your favorite anime character. That could be anything. As long as you think it's a word, it's a word. Which which no Scrabble dictionary is needed to play Letter Jam. Right. If you I want snarf like to that. be a word, snarf, yes, is snarf a word. would be a word. 
<laughs> we we used brands when we played. Yeah, yeah. I definitely used a brand name. Uh, I think the 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 toughest situation I think we found in the entire game um, is when the same letter is up in multiple yes. positions Oof. in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. That when that happens, it really throws a wrench into how things go. And I think, yeah, I'm not, I'm still not sure of how to best deal with that as a player. When that, happens. I think it's one of those experience. If you play now that we've experienced it, the next time it I, comes up, I don't know. No, you're going to keep still, it in your mind that, Oh, one of those letters could yeah, be my it's letter. It's possible, but I mean, it, it still really throws a wrench into things. Yeah. All right. Finally, we're going to get to a game I have been wanting to teach Sean to play for a very long time, at least since we started this podcast and talking about games together, and that is Blood Bowl Team Manager, which sadly I think fell a little more flat than I had expected it to. Uh, you didn't seem to be all that impressed with this area control Euro game that somehow manages to actually feel like a Blood Bowl League tournament. No, it, it does. I, this is what I, I, I am a huge Blood Bowl fan. I have played the miniature game, not much, but some. I have played the video game many, many times. I, I really enjoy the world of Warhammer's Blood Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that overall in theme and feel, this game captures it quite well. Um, there's, there's two possible things that may have sort of harmed this. One I picked the human team, and as any real Blood Bowl player knows, humies are a waste of, you know, the field. There's no reason to be playing humies on the field. Uh, and that Unless you want have, a challenge, I yeah, think. And that, and that may have hurt it as a first time out there. But overall, I mean, it was just, it felt, it felt kind of swingy. It felt a little bit too random uh, to really, to really give me that, the fun I was hoping for. Um, and, and that is part of, of the Blood Bowl, you know, the miniature game is that random. That random, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, again, that's definitely part of it. But uh, it just felt, a, it fell a little flat as a result uh, yeah. of that in our play. Uh, I would be willing to give it a try again. It's not like I'm, I'm going to say, no, this game is horrible. I would never play it again. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it didn't give it the uh, best opinion to start off with. Yeah, I think part of this too is I probably overhyped the game a little more than I should have. I still love it, but I, 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 I had there was a runaway leader problem in that particular game, so it's a little, a little hard to keep up with because I, I know the game more and I played it more than both Ian and Sean, and I took advantage of that. I think. <laughs> but yeah, next time I know to lose. No, that's not it. <laughs> <clears throat> So one game we planned to play, like to the fact Sean sat down and read the rule book. And then somehow the night we sat down to play, we ended up with Letter Jam, which we decided because Deanna wandered around the room and was like, oh, yeah, we have to review that. We should play Letter Jam because I buried it underneath my quiver because Sean was sorting my copy of Aventuria while I was busy, I think, playing Animal Crossing or working. I can't remember which. And I totally forgot that we were going to play Space Base. And I feel bad because for a couple reasons one while well, we planned it and sean read the rules and we were looking forward to it sean's a huge valeria fan so is deanna so am i this is supposed to be the, the valeria killer and here we forgot to play it which pretty much reminds me of every other time sean's down and we forget to play blood bowl team manager so there had to be some game we left behind there we go. so after sean left um i don't think it was that night but coming up in the coming weekend deanna and i did sit down and play and we played four games in a row and this isn't a quick party game. Not, not that it's long, but like this had that effect that I, I honestly don't remember the last time this happened. I'm thinking it might've been Azul was the last game this happened where I played just the first round and I'm looking at it and going, man, that was good. All right. I want to play again. Let's go right now. Let's play again. And then I played a second time. I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, this works. I get this. I liked it. Let's play again. And we did that four times. We even talked about doing it a fifth time, despite the fact it was four in the morning. And we didn't. We were like, no, four in the morning. Discretion is the better part of valor. We did not play a fifth time. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. This game is fantastic. It is really good. I'm not going to give you a full description of it because we are planning on doing a full review of Space Base. And uh, here officially announced on our podcast right now, 
Uh, we're going to give away a copy of Space Base. Like, I, not only do I love this game, I want someone else to love this game as well. So we are going to do a review of Space Base, and we're going to do a giveaway of Space Base tied to that review. We're going to make it worldwide even this time. So we're going to we're going to open this one up. I don't know when it's going to go live. I'm not. I haven't planned that far ahead because for one, I need to play a bit more Space Base. I need to try it with four people, especially. I need to play it with three people. I need to try other player counts. Um, I am impressed by this game though. Like, I, but I will say before I go away. This does not kill Valeria Card Kingdom. No Jones theory. Sorry. This is not a Valeria Card Kingdom killer in any way. They're yeah. similar, but no. Well, I have to it, say, after after reading the rules and uh, and watching the unboxing the day it happened, uh, I'm upset I didn't get to play this one. It looks fun. Yeah, I, I feel bad. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> like, like the, the, Here's an amusing thing that I had mentioned. So one of the things we did while Sean was down is uh, actually it was all while he was on his way back home is I kept thinking of the games that we should have shown him when he was there. So I have now actually made a shared Excel file in our tabletop bellhop drive where we can put in the games for Sean to play when he comes back down so that we don't forget about them again. So, so space space is on there. So that, that is the next time Sean's in town. Um, It does exist on tabletop simulator. Yes. So I got to admit next time a tabletop simulator goes on sale, I I may fork out the $10. Yeah. There's going to be, there's going to be more tabletop simulator. Right oh, there. it will be. It all it's fifty percent <laughs> off all the time. Yeah. It probably is right now, to be honest. So I'm I'm going to be strongly considering picking up tabletop simulator just to be able to play space space, and then we'll get Mr. Carney involved and do that on a Sunday night at some point. All righty. Uh, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So unless things change, the plan for next week, which they always could change, who knows. Um, we are planning on reviewing a couple more cooperative games. So I, we seem to be on a cooperative game kick. Uh, this time they're going to be cooperative card games. Uh, one we were just talking about, Letter Jam. We're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to try to <laughs> succinctly describe Letter Jam. I'm probably going to do that with the rule book open in front of me to see how they described it. So I got to admit, that was a game. I read the rules and I was like, oh, what's going on? Yeah, it's And I went and watched, a, a, I think it was a Rodney Smith. It might've been a Rado. I watched someone's video because I was like, I don't get it. And then I watch the video. I'm like, oh, okay, that's not so bad. Maybe we have to do that. Maybe we're just going to like embed someone else's how to play video in the middle of our review instead of me actually telling you how to play. I don't know. So there's that one. Um, for gameplays, I'm looking forward to this right here. Machi Karo, Bright Lights, Big Cities. Um, city, sorry, Big City. I don't know exactly how this compares to Machi Koro, but Machi Koro is the other game that's the roll dice to get resources to buy new cards so that you have more possible resources you can get with your dice games, which I don't know what you call those dice driven resource generating tableau builders, uh, whatever. So Valeria card kingdoms and well, space base, well, Machi Koro's like kind of one of the big, big games in that series. Um, our chat room's calling roll and get games, I guess, uh, random roll resource generation, tableau building games, whatever there. So I want to try it now. If someone knows if this is a good representation of Machi Koro, I'd love to know how this compares to the original because I don't I don't want to run out and grab the original to compare. I'm hoping I can just use this. So that's on the list because I want to I want to do that. So when we do review Space Base officially, I can compare this game as well. And well, I want to play Space Base because I like I think that's what we'll do when the show's done. Deanna and I should go downstairs, <laughs> play some Space Base, and then maybe some more Space Base. And I'll break out some charcuterie and play some Space Base. <laughs> No, it's good. It's like I said, it's been a while. It's it's been a while since something I have a feeling it's gonna be like a zool on our podcast that for like for six months we're gonna be mentioning it <laughs> when we get into the week in review. I don't know. Now, this is another man. I wish we were out in public so I could share this game with more people. Uh, like I know Kevin in our chat room has gone out and gotten his own copy, having to search around to find a copy. And I'm like, man, you should have got to play it with us. <laughs> Other than that, who knows? I, I haven't planned past that. I do have more stuff to unbox. I got birthday games. Um, of course, I have Great Western Trail now that they've announced a new edition, so that always makes me feel great. Still looking forward to trying that. Uh, we got some heavier Irish gauge in the pile. I might get those unboxed this weekend. I don't know. We'll see. I got lots to play. There's lots of games. And and uh, that we haven't been talking about the Pile of Shame, but it was nice. I got stuff off the Pile of Shame. Like Scott Pilgrim came from the Pile of Shame. Um, there was some other stuff. Now I'm drawing a blank. I just talked about them all. <laughs> Reef was a, was, a, was a Christmas gift, the dungeon thing. There was something else. We got off the pile of shame, and I don't remember what. Like something I've owned for a while. Oh, well, doesn't matter. All right, moving on. Now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. 
Jeff Seuss, thank you so much. Kator, miss seeing you on Friday nights. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, great to see you in the chat room again tonight. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop. One word, you can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find the Tabletop Bellhop gaming podcast cast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. And if you enjoy the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts and help support the show, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game Game on. on.